Uh, thanks, Noah, for that great talk. I learned a ton. And a uh, very brave of you to demo a string typed uh, demo live. Uh, so welcome again uh, to the Swift Language User Group. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Kyle. Uh, I'm an iOS developer here on Driver Labs. And I've been here just over a year now. And I wanted to talk about some of the things I've learned about experimentation in that time, or how not to A-B test. So just to make sure we're on the, on the same page, uh, even though A-B testing has become pretty commonplace over the last few years, I wanted to go over a quick example. Uh, so let's say you have an idea for an improvement, uh, and you think maybe that a yellow sign-up button will increase your sign-up conversions, but you want to measure that and validate that it's actually better. Uh, an A-B test is where you randomly show your users two or sometimes more different experiences, and use statistical analysis to determine which performs better. And that's where the name comes from. You're showing experience A versus experience B. Hence the name A-B test. Uh, and some other terms I might use are control, where that's the existing experience that you're showing your users, and treatment, which is the variation. Now, when people hear A-B testing, I think a lot of them think dynamic languages or interpreted. You're like updating your UI on the back end. But Swift is a compiled static language. So let's take a look at how we implement an A-B test there. For the, for the sign-up button, it would be pretty simple, something like this. But there's a lot going on here, so I'm going to go over it. Feature flag is a class where we define static instances for each uh, feature that we're testing. And it provides two functions, dot .on and dot .off, which you pass a closure. And it'll call it based on whether the user is in your treatment, in this case the yellow sign-up button, or it'll call the off one if they're not. And in the on closure, we style our button with the yellow background and black text. And in the off closure, we set the blue background and white text in the current experience. So that's how we implement the variation. But there's a lot more going on here. Uh, two keywords are assignment and exposure. Now, assignment is how the app knows which experience to show the user, whether the feature is on or off. And that happens on launch when we download a configuration. And that tells the device which variant to use. But a common pitfall here is to consider this the exposure, that is, act as if the user is in your experiment. Let's say the user opens the app but never goes through the sign-up flow, uh, and you count them in your experiment. The, you're, you're misrepresenting the metrics because they've never even seen your test. So exposure doesn't happen until the last second. When you actually access the feature flag to set up your UI, that's when we tell the server the user has seen this experience, and you should count their metrics uh, in your statistical analysis. So now that we've created our variation, uh, we're going to ship it out into the wild with an App Store release. And after enough time, we'll get enough results to have some statistically significant metrics. And thanks to an incredible experimentation team here at Lyft, we have a dashboard that looks something like this for every experiment. It has all the statistics you're measuring, how much they've moved for your experiment, and a nice little graph to show you uh, their movement over time. And who knew you could increase signups by 1.5% just by changing the background color. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, but based on that, uh, we'll go ahead and ship the yellow button variation. Uh, and I know not every company has enough people to build their own A-B testing frameworks. So there's ones like Optimizely, Taplytics. These companies are dedicated to building uh, like the feature flag implementation that I showed you. So almost two years ago, Lyft decided to do something hugely ambitious, an incredibly sized A-B test. They wanted to test a rewrite of the entire Lyft application. Uh, and this was called Project X internally. This was a complete redesign, so we had a few goals. We wanted a fresh start, essentially an entirely new app. And we also wanted effortless cleanup. With our other experiment, all you have to do to clean it up is delete one of the feature flags or sorry, delete one of the closures and keep the closure that won. We had a lot of differences, though, including how we handled app launching, notifications, and more. And you're probably thinking, no, they didn't. Well, yes, we did. We had not one, not two, but three app delegates in our app, <laughs> two of which led to entirely different projects, the V4 application and Project X, and one of which implemented every single delegate method and based on the feature flag would forward to the correct implementation. Now I want to take a side note. There is another way you could do this. Uh, if you built an iOS app before, you've probably seen the at UI application main annotation on your app delegate. And according to the docs, this is equivalent to calling a function of the same name. 
And you can actually implement a main.swift where you import UI kit and call that function with the name of the class that you want your app delegate to be. So in theory, you could check a feature flag here and call this function with a different app delegate. And this instantiates the application object. It instantiates the delegate and sets it for the application, but also does things like set up the main event loop. Uh, and you have to call this synchronously within this function. So we had some bootstrapping we had to do, hence the multi-delegate method. But that worked great for us. And it was a really neat idea. Now we could iterate on the new project and not worry about interop or breaking the old app. But they were all in the same project, and we even shared some modules between them. So after a ton of incredible work and a beautiful redesign, it was time to run the experiment. But our results were a little like this. The metrics were all over the place. Some metrics were up in big ways, but others were down. And that's when we realized some of the downsides of an A-B test this big. It's hard to tell what's broken and why when you've made so many changes. Maybe a specific button placement was hurting conversion. Or maybe it's because we added or removed steps from different flows. Maybe the design was just less intuitive for some users. So since metrics, since metrics were down, uh, we were iterating on this for a long time. Uh, and that led to the second downside. It's hard to maintain two entire applications. Every feature team at Lyft was trying to decide, do we build for v4 so our users see it now? Or do we build for Project X for the future? Or do we need to build for both versions? And this applies to any really large change you make to your app, not just A-B testing your entire app. So clearly an A-B test can be too big, it seems. There was one silver lining. It was just as easy as we wanted it to be to delete the old app. <laughs> That's a real commit. Uh, <laughs> so let's switch gears to the driver app and look at an A-B test we ran here. This one's perhaps a little more similar to our login button example. Uh, we recently rolled out a feature to show passenger demand to our drivers, and that's the control that you see was the original experience. Uh, but we wanted to improve the readability and design of the graphs to fit our product language a little better. So we came up with the design on the, the treatment side. <clears throat> so how did we go about implementing this A-B test? It's much smaller. Uh, we're really into protocols here at Lyft. Uh, and from the beginning, the graph view was actually implemented using a protocol. It had methods like display data, internal methods for calculating curves, uh, and any sort of graph view that you wanted to build, you could conform to this protocol and get those convenience methods and easily have a shared API for displaying your data. So our demand graph view, which contains the other metadata like the labels and the chart itself, looked something like this. It had a private property called graph view, and that's just the type alias of UI view and graph displaying. So we don't care what kind of graph view is being used here, as long as it conforms to the protocol. And we, when we display our view model, we can call display on that, and we have that through the protocol. So when we wanted to do our redesign, we created a new interactive bar graph view uh, that also conformed to the protocol. And based on our feature flag, we either set it to the interactive bar graph view or the bar graph view. And our demand graph view was none the wiser, and you could set the data the exact same way doesn't matter what the implementation was. So we got ready to roll this out, and our results came trickling in. It looked a little something like this. Now this test was nice and self-contained, but we didn't really get any useful results. And flat metrics doesn't always mean your experiment was poorly designed. But looking back, it's clear that an A-B test can be too small or subtle. If there's not a clear improvement, if you're not really changing much, it may not be worth the effort of A-B testing. Uh, and there was another point I wanted to make here. It, it's important to have a hypothesis that you're testing when you have a test. We sort of thought the design was better, but we didn't really know what was expecting to change, so our results didn't have any meaning. So what does a good A-B test look like? It needs to be small enough to be self-contained and not affect too many metrics, but large enough to merit testing, and it needs a hypothesis worth testing. So let's look at another driver uh, application test. Up until a few months ago, uh, the driver home tab looked like this on the control side. It was a news feed, and when you pulled up, it showed you like uh, messages from marketing, information about expiring documents, other stuff like that. It's not super relevant when you're opening the app, honestly. It's information that you go to when you need it, uh, but it doesn't need to be there all the time. So we wanted to update it to a new panel that showed 
incentives, show them the demand that I was talking about, and help them decide if they should go online right now and drive, or help them schedule their day with a, a future schedule uh, to know when to drive. So unlike the graph view, uh, here's what the implementation looked like. Now unlike the graph view, the APIs for these two panels were completely different. Uh, each of them had delegates that they needed to interact with, they had their own APIs, so we couldn't really do a type alias to keep this nice and clean. Uh, but one thing that helped us out here was lazy vars. When you add the keyword lazy to a property, it's not instantiated until that property is accessed. So we can have properties for both these view controllers and methods that reference them, but if they're never called, they won't get instantiated. So in our view to load, based on our feature flag, we either set up the incentives panel or set up the newsfeed panel, and the other one is never instantiated. So once we shipped this, the results came in, and they were pretty actionable. The metrics we helped to move up were up. Some were flat, and that was great, because they were metrics that we didn't want to affect in the first place. And some were down, but they were metrics that we expected to be down based on our changes. They made sense, given the context. Uh, things like newsfeed views were down significantly, of course. So to go over a swift recap, pun intended, <laughs> of what we learned, uh, we learned what that UI application main does on your app delegate and how to A-B test an entire app, though I don't recommend it. We saw how protocols can help have a clean A-B structure and make it easy to clean up later. And in cases where that doesn't work, lazy can help, so you're not instantiating things unnecessarily. And as far as A-B testing, try and limit your scope so that you're not affecting too many areas of the app and moving too many metrics. Have a solid hypothesis that you're testing so that your results have meaning and build for shipping. Uh, something we always strive for, I meant to touch on this earlier, is uh, quick experimentation cleanup. As you add A-B tests to your app, you add enormous complexity. You have all these different variations, all these different code paths you could be hitting. So the protocol and the lazy vars help us make it easy to delete our old tests and ship them. And that's all I've got. Thanks for listening. And have some time for some questions. Not you again. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, backing the feature flag class is something that you download from the server. So does that mean the app is being blocked in the beginning when it's downloading this payload, or is it being handled some other way? That's a good question. Uh, so it's actually not blocked during that config download uh, for two reasons. One, so that we're not blocking the app launch. And secondly, we don't want to, that's the main reason actually, we don't want to block the app launch. And because of that, the feature flags that it downloads aren't actually applied until the next time the app is launched. So it'll download a new config, but continue to use the old one until the app is relaunched. Any other questions? Um, so you mentioned that uh, we can't really um, measure um, exposure when the, you just launch the app because people might not see the flow that you're looking at. Um, what would you recommend for seeing both control and treatment and like looking at metrics for people that actually did see the experiment? Uh, what I recommend for looking at them? Could you clarify? Uh, I, I guess, uh, so my question is for uh, how, how can you track people that are in control that have not, whether they have seen or they have been basically exposed to that if-else condition that, that we're looking at? So I don't know all the details. I'm not on the experimentation team, but we do keep track of the assignment separately. It's just that you want to be careful not to, it may, it may be relevant to look at those metrics uh, in some cases, but if you're looking at somebody in the control who never saw your variation, uh, then you're not really testing whether or not your variation is working or not. Uh, does that help? Yeah, w would you recommend potentially, um, and I'm thinking about this from also from the server side, like. Um, would you recommend uh, adding another data point that gets fired for, hey, this is the place where I would have sent a message, but I didn't because they were not in the experiment? Oh, I, see, I think I see what you're asking. So when, when we fire an exposure event, we actually fire whether or not you're in control or treatment. Uh, and that way the server knows all the users that are in the control and all the users that are in treatment. So at the point of accessing the feature flag, uh, that'll tell the server which one you're seeing. 
not just if you're in treatment. It'll tell the server even if you're in control. Uh-oh. That was not me, correct. sorry. Uh, any more questions for Kyle? Uh, do you ever revert a user from the treatment back to the control, uh, or, you know, go back and forth? We try to avoid going back and forth uh, because that's resulting in feature thrash. It's probably not ideal for the user. There are some cases, of course, where the experiment fails, so we do revert it, and then everyone is seeing the control again. And there's also something called PAPA testing, hour on, hour off. I don't know a ton about it, uh, but essentially it turns the experiment on for a marketplace for an hour and then turns it off for an hour and does it repeatedly so that you can measure marketplace effects. And that's a little different than an A-B test. Usually we only do it when we're testing something the user can't see, uh, like backend algorithms, stuff like that. Uh, so there are some cases where you might go back and forth. But generally, we try to avoid it so that they're not you know, flipping back and forth between two experiences, because that's not great. Thank you again, Kyle. Thanks, everyone. Great talk.